Okay, let's walk through some examples uh, of using the chi-squared goodness of fit test and hopefully this will demonstrate the range of possibilities to some extent that of situations this can be used for as well as how to do the calculations. In the past I've had some students tell me that they were pretty comfortable with chi-square tests. Uh, they're not the hardest things to calculate. It's different from what we've been doing before but it's not terribly complex. Once you get used to it you can just march on through these things. Let's recall that hypothesis test testing with the chi-square is uh, just the same as hypothesis testing with everything else. We have pieces that plug into all the little parts. We have hypotheses, we have critical statistic, we have the observed sample point estimate, we have the null hypothesis, etc. So let's walk through this first example. Let's imagine, now I've taken this from the open intro people and modified it slightly, that a, a computer programming team is trying to de debug something they've written that's very complex and they suspect the problem could be in one of three areas of the program and they think to themselves if the problem was here you'd be more likely to generate this kind of a fault like in the, in the first area of the code it, you'd be more likely to generate a seg fault and if it's in the second area error area of the code then you would be more likely to generate a stack overflow error and if it's in this other area area of the code you might be more likely to generate a pointer dereference now whether I know what those things mean or not is not the point the point is I know how to do the statistics so the first step according to this team is to find out if the errors are equally distributed if they're equally distributed then this strategy doesn't work because it won't point them to any particular error <coughs> So they have to figure out first if these errors are equally distributed. So they run the application a hundred times with varied inputs and then they count the kind of errors that get generated. Now they're going to do a hypothesis test to see whether the pattern of errors deviates from equal distribution. And this is a fairly common thing to do with um, goodness of fit tests, with chi-square goodness of fit, is to see whether the pattern of errors deviates. Now the as you can see at the top of this slide here, this, this is called one-way chi-square. One-way means um, your table is just one frequency table. It, it's just a one-dimensional frequency table. It just has some categories. There's not two variables. There's just one variable. So the chi-square goodness of fit test is sometimes called a one-way chi-square. Anyway, just a little note before we move on. The null hypothesis that they have is that the three types of errors are equally likely to occur. That equal likelihood business came from uh, the wording here. You can say if the errors are equally distributed, that's an equal likelihood type of a hypothesis test there. Equally likely to occur. And the alternative is just not the null. The alternative hypothesis is always whatever the null is not. We always try and construct them so that between the two of them they cover all of reality or all possibilities that could happen as a result of the of the test. So the three types of errors are not equally likely. They're not equally distributed. Now this is about the population of all possible errors that could be generated by the program, which is kind of an, maybe an infinite space of possible things that could happen. I'm not quite sure. Why did I do this emphasize -y thing? Okay, good for me. Uh, so let's dive in here. Let's, let's get the results. So the observed values, which is an O, oh, that's not a zero, the observed values, uh, they ran their program 100 times, and this is what happened, 25 times it generated seg faults, 28 stack overflow, and 48 or 47 times it point, generated a pointer dereference. So of course that up to, uh, those add up to 100 because they only had 100 things. Now they've set this up so that there is only one thing that can happen for each run of the program so that they're so that this data is mutually exclusive so the categories are mutually exclusive of each other now we can look up our critical chi-square value it has two degrees of freedom because there are three categories seg fault stack overflow point of dereference three minus one is two so two degrees of freedom we already said alpha is going to be 0.05 so it's just like looking up an f critical you just look that up in in the back of your textbook and you find out that the critical chi-square value if I looked it up right is 5.99 let's hope I looked it up right so we could we could um, graph both our null hypothesis and our observed values so our expected and our observed values and I really like to graph things like this because it gives you a visual reference for what's going on for how much deviation there is so the red values are the expected values according to the null hypothesis notice how the tops of them line up with each other they're flat 
So that's the expected according to the null hypothesis. And the blue values are what was actually observed. So the question is whether those, the deviation of the blue values from that flat line that should have happened if, with the red, uh, if that deviation is enough to convince us that there's a true deviation happening in the population. In other words, whether the program itself is going to preferentially generate a certain type of thing more, like it's going to generate more pointer dereferences and fewer seg faults. Um, well, really, it looks like it's just more pointer dereferences than anything else. So, is that enough of a deviation for us to think that it's happening in the population of all possibilities, not just in this one sample? So we could highlight the deviations there. Those are the deviations. Too many pointer dereferences and by comparison not enough sex faults and stack overflows going on there. So going through and calculating, let's put our formula up here. Let's put our data up here. There's our observed values. Now let's get our, our expected values. Finding the expected values is always the tricky part in chi-square. It'll be a little bit more tricky in certain ways and less in other ways when we do chi-square two-way. But finding these um, expected values requires us to think about our null hypothesis and apply it very directly to the data. It's not just a question of saying what's the implied mean. We have to imply the null hypothesis to every single cell in the data. We have to say if we had run this program a hundred times, because we ran it a hundred times, so we have to have direct apples to apples type comparison. If we had run this program a hundred times and the null hypothesis were true, and the null hypothesis is that all of the types of errors are equally distributed, and the null hypothesis were true, and the null hypothesis was, ex hypothesis was expressing itself perfectly in this sample, then what would, we, what would we have seen? We would have seen this. We would have seen 33.3. Now, of course, you can't have a 0.3, but let's just say, who cares? Because that's what we do with chi-square all the time. We have these fractional values. So that's our expected value, and then we can subtract our observed and expected from each other, and we can get the, the difference between observed and expected. We square that difference, we add up, or we divide that squared difference by the expected value, and then we add all that up and we end up with 8.55. So our chi-square observed value for this study is 8.55. Now we have to, f we, we already specified a critical value, and this is what the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom looks like. It's just a ski slope going straight to the right. Our alpha value is in red, going from our critical value, of course, all the way to the right. Our critical chi-square was 5.99 for two degrees of freedom, alpha is 0.05. And then our observed value was 8.55, so it's definitely in the rejection region. We are going to reject the null hypothesis there. P is definitely less than alpha. See, the blue stripey part is much smaller than the red part. So we reject the null hypothesis. There are statistically significant differences in the likelihood of the different types of errors. And so that'll help those programmers debug their code. Now they can look in whatever area it was that generated the pointer dereferences. So here's a little bit more formal rundown of things. The next step would probably be to perform proportion tests between pairs of error types to determine which is the most versus the least likely to occur. And it's very similar to post hoc tests after you do an ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA. You often would do post hoc tests to test whether there are differences between individual groups, individual sample means. We do the same thing. You would do a proportion test, break this up into groups of two, two at a time. Here's another example. A geneticist breeds red and white flowers. Now feel free to pause this, work through the entire process, especially see if you can form this into a good chi-square type situation, get the data right, etc. Well, you'll have to actually see the data before you can do that. The null hypothesis here is that a quarter of the flowers are going to be red, a quarter white, and a half pink. And that's just basic um, non-dominant, non-recessive genetics uh, according to me reading the internet, because what am I, a geneticist? No. So, this is what she expects should happen if her theory of the way the gene, the color gene is working, is correct. That there should be that distribution of flowers. So she grows 64 crossbred flowers, and she wants to know, do they follow this pattern? Is there a significant deviation from this pattern? She wants them to follow this pattern. So this is a weird situation, because her preferred hypothesis is actually the null hypothesis. So for that, for that reason, it's, it's common when your preferred hypothesis actually fills the space of the null hypothesis in the analysis. It's common to set alpha very high to make it harder for you to achieve your preferred hypothesis. So it's harder to um, 
to not reject the null. It's easy to reject the null when alpha is 0.05, right? So she wants to make it easy to reject her preferred hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is good fit. The null hypothesis is that her theory will will be expressed nicely in the flowers. So this is what she gets. From 64 flowers, she gets 18, 16, and 30. Now the null hypothesis said it should be 1 fourth, 1 fourth, and 1 half, red, white, and pink. And so the expected values would look like this. The red values would look expected. 1 half, 1 half, so that should be 16, 16, and 32. And the observed values are pretty close. There's not much deviation there. It's really close. Now that yellow one, I'm just saying there's no deviation. That's my way of saying, yeah, badly, no deviation. So she gets these values. It's easy to calculate the expected values. If you had grown 64 flowers and half, half of them were pink and a quarter were red and a quarter were white, then it would have to be 16, 16, and 32 like this. So we can calculate everything else. O minus E, there you go. O minus E squared. And then O minus E squared divided by E. I really put that formula in a bad place. Anyway, when you add up all of those, those chi-square components, the bottom row is what we call the chi-square components for each cell. You end up with a chi-square value of 0 0.38. Well, what was I thinking here? Was I blind? Oh, some of the cells were hidden. So let's do a diagram of this. This is, again, the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, which looks like a happy little ski slope. So our critical value, again, it was 5.99. Oh no, it's not. What am I thinking here? That is crazy for me. Um, yeah, I made a mistake here. Critical value isn't 5.99 because I forgot I set alpha at 0.15, but I left the graph for 0.05 on there. Oh, mentally adjust because I'm probably not going to go back and record this tonight. Um, but we're still not going to reject the null hypothesis. Our p value is 0.83 that's definitely bigger than 0.15. So even leaving aside me picking the wrong critical value, if you know the p-value, you don't need to know the critical value. p equals 0.83, that's gigantic. It's bigger than 0.15. So we set alpha at 0.15, at 0.15, but p is greater than alpha. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. We fail to reject it, which is good. So the observed distribution is not significantly different from the predicted distribution, so we retain the hypothesis that the genetic theory is correct. Since we didn't reject the null hypothesis, there's nothing else to do. We're not going to compare different groups to each other two by two and do proportions tests for that. No, it's not going to happen. Let's do another one. Let's say that, um, and actually, I think this came from some real data. So 10 years ago, the smoking habits of 40 to 50-year-old men were as follows, like this. When they were asked in a survey, in a very large study, um, how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke per day? A pretty good random sample. Uh, a little less than half said they don't smoke. 17% said they smoked one pack. 24% said two pack. 10% said three pack. 6% said four or more packs. And actually this is getting to be 20 years ago now because I've had this example for a long time. So that was the distribution of the number of packs of cigarette that these men smoked. Well, in a recent random survey of smokers in this age range, we get this, these numbers. 406 saying 0, 164 saying 1, out of an N of 863. So have 40 to 50 year old men's smoking habits changed? And so let's say alpha equals 0 0.01. There's a big sample size, so we definitely, if there's anything going on there, we should be able to reject the null hypothesis at a pretty stringent alpha level with such a big sample size. If we can't, then maybe there's really nothing going on. And that's one good reason to choose a strict alpha level is because you just have a gigantic sample size. And keep yourself a bit honest about that. So the null hypothesis is that the true smoking habits now are the same as they were 10 years ago for that age range of people. So for instance, that the that the true percentage in the population, now our sample won't be exactly the same, but let's say the population is the same as that population from 10 years ago. The alternative hypothesis is that the smoking habits are now different, that the distribution of frequencies across those categories should be different, not the same as it was 10 years ago. So we're going to take that, we're going to take that pattern from 10 years ago, and that's going to be our null hypothesis pattern. So that red pattern, the red bars, those are the percentages that we took from our from that previous study, we took those percentages and we applied them to our sample size. We said, you know, what's 43% of 800 and whatever it is? And that gave us this one frequency over there and, and on and on like that. So we applied the percentages from that previous study to 
the overall sample size in this study to figure out what should have happened if that's what's really going on in the population and if we had done our, st done our study like that. And so we can see that there are some deviations. Our observed values deviate from the expected values in various, in various places, and it's hard for me to tell whether that's enough. Now with a sample size of over 800, I suspect it is, but I'm not really sure. So here's some data. Here's our observed value. Now let's, let's see how we figured out what those expected values should be. That H0 row there in gray, 43%, 17%, 24%, those are the values from the former survey. So we're assuming that that is the population, uh, that's the population distribution of smoking 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 plus packs back in the day. And then we have our observed values, but our observed values are frequencies, not percentages. Well, everything has to be turned into frequencies or you can't do a chi-square. You can't do a chi-square using percentages. So you have to take that null hypothesis value and turn it into an expected uh, frequency. So we, with an N of 863, 0.43 times 863 gives you 371.09. So 43% of 863 is 371.09, 17% of 863 is 146.71, 24% of 863 is 207.12, etc. So that's how we found the expected values here. And then it's just a matter of subtracting, observed minus expected, squaring, and then dividing by expected. Add all those things together and you get a chi-square of 20.54. And you might say, oh my gosh, that's huge. But sometimes you need very big chi-squares to reject the null hypothesis. So I'm looking at this and I'm not quite sure whether this is going to reject the null or not because I can't remember all the different ways the chi-square distribution works. Sometimes it has gigantic numbers in it that are actually the critical value. So yeah, but yeah, in this case, totally rejected it. So check this out, yeah. Alpha is 0.01. If we look up in our table, um, our critical chi-square was 5.99 for two degrees of freedom, alpha of 0.01. And then our observed chi-square was 20.54. That is deep in the rejection region there. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And actually, I calculated the p-value, it's 0.014. If I did that right, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and check that. So the chi-square observed, 20.54. Observed is greater than critical, therefore our p is less than alpha. Our alpha was 0.01. We reject the null hypothesis and we can say that the observed distribution now in our sample of smoking habits is not the same as that distribution that formed our null hypothesis distribution, which happens to have been the sample from 10 years ago. So the next step would be to do pairwise comparisons to find out where the differences really lie. Um, so we would do proportions tests, two at a time, two groups at a time, to figure out where the which differences in the sample between pairs of groups we think are reflecting differences in the population. So I hope this has helped you understand what the goodness of fit test is like. There's not going to be any more uh, lecturing on the chi-square goodness of fit test in these video lectures, though we might cover it a little bit more in the classroom, but that's where you asking questions comes in if this isn't making sense.